Um, hello everyone, my name is Simone. I'm a final year PhD researcher in Moses Group at Newcastle University, and I'll be chairing the HCA Maker Jam Q&A with our group today. So I'm really excited to introduce you to our team. We're based at Newcastle University in the Biosciences Institute. So I guess in normal times, um, we would be walking past this really sunny looking building um, on campus, but a lot of people are doing mixed working right now. So a lot of us are working from home and still doing that. Um, and really the aim of our group's research is to look into how um, our immune systems develop and maintain health and really looking into fetal development in human. And um, this, these are just some examples of how we look into single cells in the middle with some imaging and on the right hand side, how some of the cells that we um, research look in real life, I guess. So as Maz mentioned, um, Dave Horsfall, who is here actually on the call, has made a really beautiful website for us um, since he joined as a research software engineer. So you can um, read the biographies of people in our group on that website if you want to know a little bit more. And um, well, a lot of the people that you can see in this smiley picture that was done sort of before the pandemic, um, strange faces there from Dan, but uh, I, think, I think it's still a really nice picture. So um, going forward to introducing the speakers, we have six people from our team that will be speaking today about their work, Emily, Isaac, Beth, Rachel, Michael, and Jim. They'll all be giving a five minute talk each and at the end we should then have around 15 minutes for a Q&A. So if you have any questions while people are speaking please just put them in the chat and we can remember to get back to them toward the end. But if there's not time to answer your question um, at the Q&A at the end you can again go to the website and try to find the contact info for the people you'd like to speak to a little bit more and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to reply to you. And one note before we go ahead that there um, will be um, medical images or in or illustrations of fetal development in some of the talks so please just be mindful of that before we go into um, the speakers uh, sessions so that's me done I think I'll stop speaking now um, I'll introduce you to the first of our speakers um, Emily Stevenson who is a PhD student and research assistant in our group and she'll be speaking with you a little bit about the exciting work she's been doing in the past year or so about the human immune response to COVID-19. So I'll stop sharing and pass on to Emily. Thanks, Simone. So, um, yeah, so as Simone said, um, my presentation today is going to focus on our recent COVID-19 work, um, which is human immune response to COVID-19, a multi-centre study. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, us being immunologists um, and part of the Human Cell Atlas, we really want to get involved in research into COVID-19. It's this new disease that not really many people knew about. So we wanted to leverage the research framework and the infrastructure that we had um, in place with the Human Cell Atlas to begin this type of research. And within the Human Cell Atlas and within our group, we're really interested in working together um, with, with big teams of people with different skill sets um, and different expertise. So this is how we tackled this particular piece of work. And we really built on, as I said, the infrastructure and the technologies that we have available to us, which is mainly um, through our funder welcome. So as I said, this is a multi-center study. So um, it's spanned across three UK cities in the UK. So Newcastle, Cambridge and London, all of which have seen quite high infection rates throughout the pandemic. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, our clinical colleagues, Chris, Marco and Ken, um, began identifying and recruiting patients who were coming into hospital with COVID-19. However, while this was happening, our lead investigators and, and um, principal investigators from the different institutions began uh, setting up the study. They were discussing about what we were going to do and, um, and rounding up the, the, the team to be able to begin this work. So this is the, the big team of us that, that began delivering the work. Um, myself, Rachel and Fernando focused on the data generation and Gary, Carsten, Mike, Waradon and Kelvin focused on the data processing and the analysis. However, we did have a constant dialogue between all of us through things like uh, Zoom, um, instant messaging and email when it came to things like the interpretation 
rotation of the data, uh, putting together figures and actually writing the manuscript. Na toll, also in Science, wenn du die Leute siehst, dann wie die heißen hier, Carsten Bach, Mike Morgan. Stephanie, I think you are not on mute, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, um, as I said, our um, we put together this manuscript actually came out in April of this year in a journal called Nature Medicine. And you can see the, the sheer volume of authors on there, which just really shows that the, the, the big project that we, that we tackled. So what did we actually do? Well, um, we decided to look at the peripheral blood of patients coming into hospital with COVID-19. And this was for several reasons. So firstly, blood is accessible to us. It's fairly easy to process in the lab, but also it can act as a window into the overall immune system. So what I mean by this is, is when COVID infects us, it initially infects the, the airways and, and this prompts a systemic immune response within the entire body. So we're hoping that we're going to pick this up within the blood. We decided to do a cross-sectional study. So looking at patients from um, mild to critical disease in hospital, we had control samples, but also we also picked up um, some asymptomatic cases through healthcare workers screening programs. And the experimental technique that we decided to use was something called SightSeq. So this is a single cell method which allows us to profile both the protein and the RNA of individual cells. And this really helps with characterizing the cells that we would find, which is normally quite difficult to do. So our findings, um, this is a picture of all of the cells that we got from um, all of the patients and control samples. So we had nearly 1 million cells altogether. So this image just shows um, every single dot is a, an individual cell that we sampled, and they are colored by the different populations of the cells that we found. So I'll just go through just a couple of things that we found within this data set. First thing is um, within the plasma blasts and B cells. So these are the type of cells that are, that are involved in the antibody production and secretion. Um, one of these things that we found was a particular type of plasma blast or plasma cells was actually completely diminished in symptomatic COVID, which you can see here. So from asymptomatic cases, it completely drops off. And this is quite interesting is because this particular subset of plasma cells is responsible for patrolling the, the upper airways and mucosal linings. So things like the, the nose and the throat. So what this suggests to us is that the asymptomatic individuals are actually able to clear the disease much more effectively so it doesn't progress into, into the lungs and progress into a more severe disease. The next thing we, that we found was um, some predicted interactions between a couple of cells. So a, a particular type of immune cell called monocytes and platelets. And platelets, as some of you may know, are involved in, um, in clotting. So... We've heard a lot about these coagulation abnormalities within COVID and these, these types of interactions could actually be contributing to these abnormalities. So these cells could be sticking together and they could be promoting this, these clotting events, which could, which could potentially contribute into these events. Another thing which may be contributing to these events is within the platelets that we found, as the disease worsened, so in the most critical cases, the platelets were, had more increased expression of activation markers. So this tells us that the platelets become more activated within severe disease. So this is another reason, um, or potentially another reason for these abnormalities. Emily, is it okay to wrap up? Yeah, so okay. I'm at the end now. Um, I just wanted to say, finally, our, um, our data is available to download and browse completely free, which is obviously one of the big things about the Human Cell Atlas. So you can download it straight from the website, or you're also able to um, you're also able to interactively view it if you're interested in that. So yeah, this is just a snippet of some of the people involved. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, so our next speaker today is Isaac Go. He's also a PhD, research, uh, PhD student sorry, and research assistant in our team. And we'll be speaking um, from the data analysis side of things. So looking into um, how to analyze the big data. So I'll pass over um, to Isaac now to take over. Hi, everybody. So my name is Isaac, as um, Simone has already introduced me very poignantly. So today, 
uh, I'm going to be speaking about the art of big data. So in my line of work, I work with a lot of large data sets that are derived from the techniques that Emily has just brought you through. Um, pertinently, these are single cell sequencing or RNA sequencing. So RNA is, are like the messages, the messages that your cell uses to communicate with itself that are derived from its DNA. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I'd be able to convince you that big data is actually really interesting, really intriguing, beautiful to work with, and actually not that scary. So we'll get into it. Now, um, before we get there, I want to get into the nitty gritty. So the, the story, I want to get, bring you on a bit of a journey. So back in 1859, there was this guy, his name was George Sura, and some people will know him better for his artwork. And his critics basically coined his artwork, pointillism. And the way it was done was that he put down these dots on canvas. So each individual dot doesn't convey much information at all. Uh, you won't be able to see much from a dot. But as you take a step back and as he increased the number of spots on the canvas, these dots came together and formed these beautiful artful masterpieces that were created from individual dots whose properties when combined together are much more than the sum of the individual, the information that individual dots can bring across. And this is an important concept I'm gonna come back to. This is the concept of emergence. Now, the data that we work with is huge, but consists of individual segments. We read individual cells uh, we read the data that comes out or the RNA that comes out of individual cells and we read how much RNA is created in each individual cell and what RNA is being created. So this gives us an idea of what an individual cell is doing at any given time inside people development. Now, when you bring all this together, this brings a comprehensive image of what's going on at any given time in human development. And this is thus the concept of emergence where data becomes more and more meaningful the more you add to it. Now, one of the biggest issues that we have as human beings looking at big data is that our brains and the way we evolve, we were never meant to look at big data. So we use tools, we use machine learning and AI to help us cope with this. And what I'm showing here is one of the ways we use to correlate each individual cell that comes out of our pipelines to tell us more about what's going on. What you see here, each individual spot represents a single cell and the distances between the cells represent how related they are to each other based on how similar their RNA content is. And you see that as this graph relaxes, um, we are able to tell trajectories of, where, of which cells are most related to each other and which cells are least related to each other. And you see there's a center point right in the center of this graph and that represents the stem cells that make each of these trajectories. And so this is what makes everything so pertinent because these are fetal samples we're working with or developmental samples. And this trajectory structure tells us a lot about how humans develop or how the immune system develops in human development. So all our data is available on portalized, uh, all our data that is out there is available on these portals that we've designed as Emily has gone through earlier. And we can all have fun exploring biology together. We've made these portals intuitive and uh, open source so everybody can just get together, learn a little bit about um, what we do and the biology that we seek to explore. Um, so here's a project that we're working on right now. It's called the Pan Immune Project, where we're looking at the overall landscape of human development. And human development is a dynamic interplay of incredibly intricate systems. So we sometimes summarize these systems as programs, much like you would a computer program. And the combined landscape of how fetal immune system develops helps us understand the unique properties that indeed highlight uh, important factors, vital in health, and in some cases, disease. For example, cancer often reuses developmental fetal programs in order to propagate itself or spread throughout a, a living organism. One of the things that we really want to drill into in future uh, and we're working on right now is spatially resolved sequencing. So, so far I've been showing you um, maps of plots of individual cells and these were derived using called suspension techniques. What we're going into right now 
is using microscopy and integrating the techniques we have right now to generate these beautiful maps that are related exactly to anatomical loci in the human developmental immune system in order for us to look at much more intricate systems and develop um, models that predict cell-to-cell -cell interactions. I see. Uh, uh, can you wrap up, please? Thank you. Yes. So right using those systems, we can build like these in silico models that tell us or summarize using machine learning and AI what is going on in the human readable format. And this is how we conduct our research. Um, we can use these to create uh, in vivo models. In this case, we're seeing um, an organ of human skin that we've grown outside of the human body. Uh, finally, this is our lab, you, a different picture than what Emily showed, uh, all of us smiling after a, a paper submission. And uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. It's uh, a colleague of ours called, uh, a colleague of ours, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Poitner, and she's going to be talking about the skin cell atlas. Thanks, everybody. Again, if you have any questions for Isaac, please just put them in the chat. Um, and go ahead, Beth, thank you. Beth, I think you're on mute. Are you speaking now? Sorry about that. Um, oh, okay. My name is Elizabeth Poynet. Um, I'm a clinical trainee, so I'm training to be a dermatologist. So I'm a junior doctor that's training to treat people with skin disorders. And I paused my clinical training to do a PhD. And I'm going to talk about the skin cell atlas that I've been involved in during my PhD, sort of what the skin cell atlas involves, particularly how I'm involved as a junior doctor. Um, and also a brief bit about some of the results that we found as part of the skin cell atlas so far. So the skin cell atlas is part of the human cell atlas. And one of the things we're trying to do in the skin cell atlas is trying to characterize all the different types of cells and the states of these cells in healthy human skin. But then also look to try and see how the cell types and the cell states are changed in skin diseases. So human skin is uh, broadly made up of two layers. You've got the epidermis, which is the top layer of the skin, and the dermis, which is the bottom layer of the skin. And there's lots of different types of cells within the human skin. And one sort of broad group of cell types is the immune cells that Emily and Isaac have talked about. And we're particularly interested in immune cells in the skin. And these immune cells are really important because they protect us from infections um, that our skin might come into contact with and fight infections that we get. But these immune cells can also be involved in different skin diseases where the number of the type of the number of um, immune cells or the type of immune cells changes. And two of these skin conditions are atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. And these are very common skin conditions, and people are potentially familiar with these. On the left is atopic dermatitis, which we also called eczema. And this is this really sort of scaly rash that people get, particularly sort of from their elbows or behind their knees. And on the other side of the page is the psoriasis, where you get these really well defined scaly areas. And in both of these diseases, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, we know that the immune cells in the skin are involved. And therefore, as part of the human cell, and the skin cell atlas, we wanted to look and see how um, the different cell types would change between healthy skin and also atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. So how am I involved particularly as a junior doctor? Well, I work both in the hospital and in the university. So in the hospital, I'm seeing patients and I'm sort of speaking to them about the research that we were, we're doing, seeing if they want to take part, explaining what it would involve, and if they do want to take part, taking their consent. And to do the research, we need tissue. And we're really lucky with skin because it's very easy accessible. And so one of the things that I do from patients who give their consent is we take skin biopsies of the skin, but we also take things like blood samples as well. And then these samples come into the university and in this picture shows one of the laboratories that we can use in the university to process the skin samples. And then after this, I'm involved in sort of analyzing the results in some of the graphs that Emily and Isaac have already discussed as shown on the right. So I was going to discuss briefly one small part of the uh, paper that we published in January of this year that was published in the journal Science, um, looking at one type of the immune cells in the skin and some of the work that I was involved with in this. 
So using a technique called single cell RNA transcriptome profiling, which Emily and Isaac have already mentioned, we found that there was two types of macrophages in the skin and macrophages is one type of immune cell. And we labeled one type of them called MAC1, which is this sort of brighter pink color and the other type MAC2, which is this more sort of dusky color. And we found that in atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, there was an increased number of these MAC2 macrophages in atopic dermatitis and psoriasis compared to the healthy skin. Now, often when we find things through one technique, we want to then try and see if we can find the same thing, but using a different technique. So another thing that I was involved in was looking at seeing, uh, using sections of skin that we took from healthy samples, eczema and psoriasis, and then staining them for a marker. So we stained the skin with a marker that highlighted all the cells with that, which were these MAC2 macrophages. And these are shown in this slide as these purple cells. And then I was involved with other members of the team in counting the number of each of these cells within the different biopsies from patients with healthy skin, eczema and psoriasis. And again, what we found when we did this was that the number of these MAC2 macrophages again was increased in patients with atopic dermatitis, which is shown in this sort of rosy pink colour, and in psoriasis, which is shown in the grey compared to the healthy adult skin. So we managed to find through two different techniques the same finding, which we're really pleased with. So I'd like to say thank you to um, everybody for listening to this and so to also all the people in the Hannaford group that we work with and also our collaborators and funders that are shown in this slide. I was going to pass back to Simone to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Beth. Um, again, if anybody has any questions for Beth, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the Q&A at the end. So our next speaker is... Um, Ooh, Rachel Botting, who's sharing now. Um, she's a research associate in our team and has been in the group, I think, since Moz started it. And um, she's currently juggling a few projects, one on the human yolk sac and one on developing skin. And she'll be speaking about both of these projects. So I'll pass over to Rachel now. Thank you, Simone. Um, so yes, I'm gonna talk about two of the things that I work on, which is the human yolk sac and developing skin. So as a group in general, one of the big things that we're interested in looking at is how the human immune system develops. Um, so one aspect of that is hematopoiesis, which is how you get the cells in blood and how they develop. And it kind of occurs in a stepwise and a bit of an overlapping manner. So what you have is hematopo hematopoiesis begins in the yolk sac very early on in the embryo um, and then in the AGM. From there, it moves to the fetal liver and the fetal liver is really, it does the bulk of it um, during prenatal development. The bone marrow kind of steps in a bit um, within the second trimester and that's what's going to carry on throughout childhood and adult life. There are also some other organs help, I guess, develop more like the thymus and poor T cells. Also interested in how um, the immune cells that are developed in these, the tissues that they're seeding and the role that they might play within those. So I'm specifically going to talk about the yolk sac and skin within this. So when looking at the yolk sac, we're able to get these from um, samples. We get these through the HDBR, which is the Human Developmental Biology Resource. And we process these to a single cell suspension, which we then put through um, the 10X Genomics platform to get single cell RNA sequencing. So from the, we've seen these plots in some books. Um, we have thousands of genes, called dot is a different cell and we've got the gene profile from it. So using genes, um, like you can see in the table on the right, we can use those to identify what type of cell we think it is. And then we've colored the plot accordingly. Once we know what the cells are, we can go in and do some other analyses, like looking at how the landscape might be changing with decreasing with age, or you can see the fibroblasts are increasing. Um, so we can start to make some of those kinds of analyses. As Elizabeth mentioned, we're interested in looking in space. Um, Isaac mentioned this too. So here's just an example looking within the tissue. Um, and these are just a couple of stains. If you look on the left, CD34 is staining endothelium, so a blood vessel, and you can see that it forms a ring here. And then in yellow on the right, it's actually staining um, red blood cells, and you can see how they sit within it. So we can start to use markers that we've found from the sequencing um, 
to then go and look in the tissue and make these um, informed discoveries. So while we were doing that, exactly in skin and the cells that might be going there and um, what role they might be in. And one of the reasons why skin is it plays a vast array of um, functions. So temperature control, it's obviously a physical barrier. It's important for touch, um, vitamin D synthesis, et cetera. And if you look at developing skin or prenatal skin compared to mature skin, like you would have on yourself, they actually look very different. So prenatal skin, um, it's quite simple, whereas your skin, for example, will have sweat glands and hair follicles and all sorts. So we're interested in looking at how it goes from one to the other. And then looking at the immune compartment, not a lot is known. Um, so using more traditional techniques, it has been found that there are, you know, this handful of cells. And one of the things that single cell RNA sequencing has allowed is this explosion in knowledge of what is there. So we know that there's so much more in prenatal skin than was there before. And now what we're interested in doing is figuring out why and what these cells are doing. So we already know from mouse studies or looking at other tissues that it's possible they could be playing a role um, in generating or modeling the skin. So a few of these cell types um, have been linked to willing. So many of these cells are then actually helping to shift grows and changes um, in uterus. And so, yeah, as I mentioned, one of the things we're really interested in doing is linking there in what these immune cells might be doing to go from the prenatal skin and how it's developing to mature skin. Um, and as most of the other people have mentioned, this is always a big team effort. So it involves a whole lot of facilities within a university, outside collaborators, um, and obviously, the team within our lab, um, which we couldn't do it without, and obviously the samples. So thank you. And next up, we've got Michael. Thank you, Rachel. Um, again, any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So our next speaker is Dr. Michael Mather. He's a, I'm not gonna try and say otolap, he, 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 he's an ear, nose and throat surgeon to my understanding but he also dabbles in research and so he's he's just started his PhD well some months back um, and he'll be speaking a little bit about his project on otitis media so I'll pass on to you Michael. Thank, thanks very much Simone. <clears throat> Sorry I was having a bit of difficulty joining the internet there but it seems to be working now. Can everybody hear me? Yeah wonderful. Yeah so my name's uh, Michael Mather. Um, I'm a um, ear, nose and throat surgery registrar, I do my PhD, um, and we're really interested in a condition called otitis media, uh, and, and specifically the role of uh, infection fighting immune cells in the adenoids uh, of children with otitis media, and I'll explain why that is um, as we go along. Uh, so just to sort of recap what it is really, so otitis media is an umbrella term for inflammation of the uh, middle ear. So that's the part of the ear which exists behind the eardrum. So when uh, the doctor is having a look uh, at down someone's ear canal um, like this, um, what they're looking for is actually the appearances most of the time of what the eardrum looks like here. And this space, uh, which we call the middle ear behind the drum is where you can actually get infection um, or buildup of fluid, which can cause hearing loss. And we think uh, this is very likely related to um, uh, some uh, uh, tissue at the back of the nose called the adenoids. Um, and they're connected to the ear um, via this long tube, well, in reality, it's not that long, but in the picture it is, uh, connecting the back of the nose with the middle ear there, which allows bugs to come up from the nose into the middle ear space. Um, and, and that'll be important as, as we'll see shortly. Uh, um, so when uh, we're having a look in some down someone's ear canal, this is the eardrum, and you can see this is what we call acute otitis media. This is very painful and inflamed, and you can actually see this uh, sort of buildup of pus behind the eardrum there. Um, in most cases, that settles down by itself, um, or, or occasionally requiring some antibiotics. But what a, a subgroup of children are left with is actually some ongoing low-grade inflammation in the middle ear, which causes a buildup of fluid, and you can kind of see these bubbles here. And actually, this viscous fluid interrupts the transmission of sound into the ear. And it's actually the largest reversible cause of hearing loss in childhood. Um, and, and that's why we're really interested in understanding it a bit more. Um, because uh, as you can see here, this is an operation we do to remove that fluid, make a little nick in the eardrum, uh, remove the fluid, and then pop this little grommet or ventilation tube in. And this is the most common surgery performed in children in developed countries. Um, and we don't yet have a non-surgical alternative, um, but of course that would be most welcome. Um, 
The other part of clinical practice which is relevant is that um, there is evidence that removing the adenoid tissue, uh, that lymphoid tissue at the back of the nose, can help uh, resolve um, glue ear, that sort of condition with the buildup of thick fluid. Um, but we don't really know why. So actually for decades, we've been removing adenoid surgically and we don't really know why it's working. Um, and so as I said, this tissue is at the back of the nose here and is connected at the other end of that tube that connects to the ear. Um, and uh, it's removed with this rather awful looking device here. Uh, and so actually what we'd really love to do is uh, find a way towards a medical adenoidectomy, a non-surgical treatment for glue ear. Um, and of course the, lymphoid, the adenoids are lymphoid tissue, they're packed with infection fighting cells. Um, so what we really want to do is understand which infection fighting cells, um, how, how do they differ between children with glue ear and without. So that's what we're comparing. Um, and because as you can see from this diagram, Immune cells are very complicated. There are many different kinds. We need a very comprehensive technology to profile those. Uh, and that's where single cell RNA sequencing comes in, as others have mentioned. Uh, and so uh, that's what we've been doing on adenoid samples of children with and without glue ear. Uh, we've been characterizing those immune populations in those two groups. Um, we also have the added benefit of using uh, site seq. So that is all of this RNA. Uh, uh, um, technique that others have been talking about, but also we can see the proteins on the surface of cells. So they help us really pin down uh, the exact uh, cell types that are there, and they really help us understand the data a lot better. Um, and so we, we've got uh, some sort of initial results here. And as you can see uh, in this plot, cells that are very similar are all grouped, uh, grouped together. And then if they're very different, they're spaced far apart. Uh, and so we can see two big groups here, and then several smaller groups uh, of you know, very distinct cells. And we're just in the process now of working out what these different cells are. And then we're going to be comparing them between, as I say, children with and without glute ear. So we can look for targets um, for our medical adenoidectomy and hopefully avoid that awful looking adenoid curette. Um, so I'd like to say a big thank you, of course, to the Hanfa Lab and also the clinical team for helping us um, with our samples. And our next speaker is uh, Jim McGrath. Thank you, Michael. That was great. Um, again, any questions, just uh, put, put them in the chat. Um, our next speaker is Jim McGrath. He's going to, well, our final speaker, actually. Um, he's a research software engineer in our group. And he'll be speaking a little bit more about big data, so more a bit in line with um, what Isaac was speaking about before, um, about thing, big data into human perception. So I'll pass over to Jim, and then um, he will introduce us into our Q&A. So That's put the questions in now. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I guess yeah, so yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about big data, and this kind of fits across everyone's talk so far. So a lot of people talk about these really big site data sets and the RNA sequencing data sets. These are the techniques we get to understand cells. And as Isaac said, one of the issues with having these great big data sets is that human perception is actually small. And there's been lots and lots of cognitive research done on this. Um, if you try and get people to compare big numbers, they really struggle. So if you do a number line up to say 100,000 even, people are quite good at putting numbers on it. If you do a number line up to a billion, people suddenly get really bad at working out where numbers are because they can't compare numbers at that scale. Another example is our short-term memory. So you're probably familiar with this kind of tray game. Um, it's really good, you look at it for a minute, then it's taken away, you try and remember what's on it. Most people will only get seven to 10 items because that's all you can cram in in the first few seconds as you look at something. And if you get into your short-term and your long-term memory, you can remember more things, but really we like these small sets. But the one I want to talk about most is the idea of dimensions. And we think of dimensions in space or sort of like three dimensional, but a dimension is just something you can measure. So when you've got three dimensions, we can kind of work with that because we know one is a strip and there's some spaces. If you have them at right angles to each other, you get this square and you've suddenly gone from having 10 different things on it to 100 different things. If you have a third dimension, you get this nice cube with lots of points in it. And that's up to maybe a thousand possible positions in that. Um, once we get much beyond those three dimensions, our brains don't really know how to position the data. And I'm going to illustrate this by talking about the weather, because I'm very British. Um, so in the weather, say we've got a set of samples, we've got three hourly samples back in 1974, uh, and we want to know how the weather compared at each of these different times that we measured it. And we can look at the temperature, and that's one dimension, and that's quite simple. We can look at that chart. Uh, we can look at the numbers, we can see it was quite warm on the first day, it got colder in the middle, and then it gets warmer again at the end. It's quite easy to see what's going on there. 
We've now a second dimension. This is air pressure. Now we've kind of got a bit of a square of things going on. We compare those things together. And in these sort of like 20 or so samples, it's actually quite easy to see that, oh, actually, well, as the temperature went down, the air pressure went up. We can make some conclusions about that. Now we have a third one, rainfall, and there's not such a good pattern there. Some of this data is missing. We didn't have data with that because it didn't fall or because we didn't measure it. Uh, we get this in our RNA sequences a lot as well. Um, and it's starting to get harder to really understand how these three things compare to each other between different samples. And we can add more dimensions, wind speed, and we can add wind direction, and we can add the humidity on the day. We can add whether there's cloud cover and how heavy it is. And the more of these dimensions we add to our data, the harder it is for us to conceive that together and to try and draw conclusions to work out what's happening in each different sample compared to the others. So how does that compare to the human cell atlas data? Well, we're bigger than that. This little grid represents, if we had, say, about 60 dimensions over about 40 samples. That's quite a lot of data. It'd be hard for us to understand that. But that's not enough. So if we step up, here's a bigger data set. This is like 120 different dimensions over about 80 different samples. There's lots of data there. This isn't big enough. Let's do that again. It's still not enough. We now have 240 dimensions in our data. We've got 160 samples. We are nowhere near our data sets. The HCA data sets are 10, 000, tens of thousands of dimensions. They are hundreds of thousands of samples. This is literally mind blowing data. We can't fit it all in. So, how on earth did we go about trying to work this out to produce all these lovely graphs and charts that we've already seen from everyone? Well, um, Isaac's touched on this very briefly in his. So the first thing is we can't get all that data into the human brain. We can't do it, so we have to change it. We have to reduce it somehow. And there's these dimension reduction, uh, dimensionality reduction techniques that we use. And we're kind of familiar with these in three-dimensional space. You've probably seen this in GCSE maths or a level maths, depending on how old you are. Um, you've got some coordinates. So this point P is actually A distance in front of you and B distance to one side of you and C distance above you. And you've got three dimensions there. But what we're really interested in is the distance. So if we go from O, that's say the bus, to the point P, which might be something on the wall we want to pick up, uh, we can turn that into one dimension. It's just the distance, and that's one dimension. And then we can go, it's that far away, and pick it up from in front of us. And we can do that. If there's another point down here, we can say we've got a point there and a point there, and we can give them a distance as well. So we can do this mathematically on a huge scale. We can do it with tens of thousands of dimensions and reduce them to these one or two dimensions which you've seen ch charted in the visualizations. So woo, we've got a solution, we can fit our data in. Well, no, I'm afraid of it. it's not that simple. Um, and there's two main problems. Firstly, like I said, we're not putting all the data in. We're selecting out what we think is most important of the data and kind of ignoring the rest of it. And there might be important stuff in there. So we're still not fitting the big data into our brain. And the second problem is we don't have all the data. So you might have noticed some of the end numbers in people's slides, Emily's um, blood samples, we have maybe n equals 70 or so in the total of the case. That's only 70 people, there's billions of people in the world. And the um, ones that we do with the fetal material is even smaller, we get maybe six or seven samples. So there's loads of samples. And we're only really looking at the RNA a lot of the time. Uh, and as people have touched on, we can actually get more data. So we can get more samples and we can get the protein data people mentioned, we can get the positional data that people have already mentioned. And um, so somewhat counterintuitively, our solution to not having enough data, and the solution to this being too big is get more data. But what we can do then is we can use that to do more analysis to infinity and beyond. And I'll hand back to Simone for QA. Thanks a lot, Jim. I think that was a nice way to wrap up, just leaning back and having to think about what this data even is and what what is data you got a little bit philosophical there um so that that's nice that's good that's what we need on a friday afternoon <laughs> so um okay thank you thank you jim you can stop sharing if you want as well um so it's nice we do actually have the 15 minutes for q a that we promised um which i didn't expect that we would have so well done everyone for for, for keeping within that time um there haven't been any questions necessarily come through on the chat, um, but maybe if people want to raise their hands and ask questions in that way, I can. we can go around like that. Does that work? Or you can just sort of unmute and say something. <laughs> You're allowed. Or maybe we can ask them questions. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to start with the first one? 
no, I was just going to ask whether people thought whether they, you know, found the session, you know, useful, enjoyed it, you know. Oh, right, you want to reverse it. You want to Yeah, basically, <laughs> to try and get people to talk. <laughs> you know, you can put a thumbs up sign or thumbs down sign. That's a good point. Do you want to do I'm, reactions? I think Dominic wants to say something. No, I was just going to say I'm always happy to talk. Uh, and it's usually a problem to get me to stop. So uh, that was really fantastic. I, I, I really loved it. I haven't really got a question. What, what tends to be happening at a lot of these events is you just, you're blowing everybody's minds. So there's like that, we're getting that stunned silence of uh, wow. And then the questions tend to come along in dribs and drabs over the course of a day. Yeah. Um, you know, the things that you wish you'd asked, that you kind of, everybody's got that kind of regret moment that they've missed an opportunity. Um, I guess I'm going to reverse your reversal of the question again back at you. And um, uh, just really, this, is, this has been a fantastic opportunity for a lot of people who are involved in kind of the arts and uh, data visualization and lots of different kind of disparate kind of, but creative technological practices to kind of find out about your research. It was really good to get uh, access links to the data as well, to the data sets. Which I've or I shared immediately uh, with the with the Maker Jam group, and some, and shared your papers as well. So it's going to be really fascinating to see if anybody uses that as well. So I guess my long winded question is wrapping up with, um, uh, um, I guess, are you excited to see what people do with the material, the, the visual artists, how they can kind of unpick what you've been doing as well? And I, I also just wanted to add that Simone. Uh, uh, not Simone, um, it was uh, Rachel. Uh, I'm kind of a bit of a fan of your research. It's a weird thing to say. I know it's a bit like having a, a favorite artist or a favorite musician, but I kind of have been following your research since we, uh, since you last spoke. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of add that as well. I'm a bit embarrassed at myself, even, even doing this. Yeah, so what would you hope to kind of see people doing, I guess is my question in brief. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Dominic. Um, it's, it's great that you're a fan. And Paulina has also said in the chat, um, great session, thank you. Um, so maybe I can go around to each, each uh, so you can respond to what Dominic was saying, and then we'll take a question from Stephanie. I think she's got her hand raised. Um, so Isaac, what do you hope people sort of do? You were sharing loads of links and things in the chat. You know what? Science is this open field with unlimited boundaries. I, I just want to see people be creative. Do anything you can and everything you can. And, you know, we will all appreciate output. It's like art. Thank you, Isaac. And um, Janet has said in the chat, um, oh no, sorry, it was Shivani that said she liked the connection with Sora and machine learning. Um, and it was a really good exposure to a topic she was uh, not so familiar with. So um, that's great. Um, and Janet has messaged as well um, that she really enjoyed it. So that's that's exciting. And I see that Dave has his hand up as well. So we'll come to, where is he going? On my screen, okay. Oh, you're blocked by my, um, my, my speech to text app on my laptop, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I can see your hand up now, Susie, uh, let me know. Okay, so um, Jim, do you want to say anything uh, in response to Dominic's thought about what you'd like people to do with the data and things? Um, yeah, I think for my part, I just love to see people exploring this idea that the data is huge and human conception is small. And I think I think a lot of artists do that anyway. They kind of like it's it, it's it's a bit what we did. Artists try and cram an entire sort of like landscape into into your eyes very quickly. And there's lots of the human brain does to filter all these things through anyway. So I'd be really interested to see if anyone comes up with a way of kind of like representing big data in an artistic way. Be very just as a concept rather than specific data. Thank you, Jim. Um, I, I realize as well that there have been some messages. Erica has said she wants to volunteer her skin. And Isaac has said, we're trying to grow skin at the moment. So one of his slides right at the end, Isaac's slides when I came in and cut him off, was on these skin organoids that he's been growing. Um, so maybe we'll go into a future where you don't have to volunteer it. So um, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Maybe I won't go around all six people to respond. Maybe you can just sort of wave or something if you're really excited to respond to a question. But I'll go to Stephanie now. She had her hand raised a while back. Did you have a question, Stephanie? 
Oh, yeah, so I I was always interested, or well, I'm always interested as a scientist who is, I mean, I've developed imaging techniques and always provided imaging for the scientific community. And I'm interested in when images become actually the message, because I, with AI and all the methods we are using, this kind of high content screening and we are actually creating lots of images, but we're turning them into, first of all, numbers. And then we turn them again into plots, which are visual representations of what we see. And I'm very interested in talking to people about which iconic image became, in a way, their inspiration for their research. I mean, images they've seen and they kind of understood the concept of something they were trying to investigate. and how people feel about this. So that's something I'm very interested in. I'm not sure that's... Maybe I'll make it open rather than going to each person. So does anyone want yeah, to Yeah, just like... One? Does anyone want to jump in? Any of the speakers, you could just unmute and go for it. <laughs> so I would just say that I think how things are displayed in science, it's a huge thing the way that we're able to get all of this across because so often we've got a whole heap of numbers in you know spreadsheets or things like that and we realize more and more we spend a lot of time composing them picking colors to make connections and all of that it's incredibly important um to really um make it all palatable to make it enticing to someone to look at and for them to be able to make the connections that we might have because I suppose speaking for myself, sometimes, you know, things will click, but you realize it's not clicked for everyone, you know? So really making sure that you've um, displayed it in a way that is easier for people to get that message. Thank you, Rachel. Does anyone else want to respond to that? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think this is something that Isaac, who also um, spoke, and me and Isaac have had quite a few sort of conversations sort of on this topic, and how we can use the imaging and how we can use new technologies in our imaging. So rather than sort of being a bit old fashioned with me and other people counting, how we can be smarter in how we use our imaging data. Um, and this is something that I think we've talked about a lot and Isaac and I have had many conversations about this um, and what we can do. If, um, a few people have started to, or the speakers, sorry, have started to respond in the chat as well if they've not had the chance to say anything. So do look there. Um, and Faria has said very nice talks, everyone. So thank you. And also everyone and speakers, there's this Discord link that's been shared so we can use that as well. And does anybody else want to respond to Stephanie before we move on? Yeah, I'll, I'll really yeah. quickly round up. Um, so Stephanie, like in terms of images that inspire uh, me, on a more recent skill, um, we have these images now, which are based on spatial sequencing, where we determine like RNA content in like a, a microscopy slide. So like a actual tissue anatomical loci and a transcript that come out of that. And you can color these based on like uh, the gene expression profiles and what, what kinds of cells you think these are. And they create beautiful images as they correlate with what's actually in um, the subject that you're studying. Uh, and along those lines, uh, the chat that I had with Beth was basically, could we replace our doctors with AI using these images, which is a comedic chat that we had. Yeah, contentious, seeing as like so many people in our group are clinical, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I guess, uh, I mean, there's a pre-filtering of information through AI and then so kind of the easy kind of decisions can be filtered, which would make it easier, no? So you only get the ones which are borderline that would be really, I'm just curious how imaging will change because I'm microscopist um, for like 25 years. That's always been my passion. And now we have that such a strong computerization mm -hmm. and number counting rather than the pure image. So there's no one anymore looking at a microscope image and going, oh, this is how the new cell type looks like, I guess. But maybe they are. I don't know. I just find it quite fascinating how what an image is and that it actually has become something very different mm -hmm. because also one image is no longer actually that meaningful it's always usually the sum of many images yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Stephanie. We're going to move on. Common, we can definitely, yeah. sure. like, we can sure. definitely take um, <laughs> this conversation offline and in emails and things, or maybe on this Discord, we could do that kind of thing. Um, so there, there has been a bit more activity in the chat, and I know that Dave wanted to ask a question. So we'll go over to Dave, and maybe uh, Michael and Emily can respond as well within this part. So do you want to go ahead, Dave? Thanks, Emil. Um, yeah, it's quite, in some ways, a follow on to Stephanie's. Uh, I've been, I'm really interested in big data and all of the speakers showed some kind of damage to the reduction plot. And there's these techniques used for reducing these very high dimensionality matrices uh, into something that we can firstly visualize, but also try to draw findings and conclusions and understanding from. And as Jim mentioned, there's techniques for doing that dimensionality reduction, and there's a few different options out there. And math, mathematicians will create those techniques. But the kind of scientific domain is very dependent on those established techniques to create those plots. And then they are used to, to kind of determine relationships between cells in those plots. Do you think there's, and this is just an open question for anyone who wants to answer it, but do you think there's enough two way between the kind of your scientific domain and the those mathematical techniques to keep up to date with what you're actually doing and pull out the relationships between cells uh, in the way that are necessary um, to actually keep up to date with, with these ever new emerging techniques do you want to um, respond to that maybe emily or michael so you have a chance to Sorry, I've kind of maybe landed them in it there with by asking something that <laughs> I'd not be interested in. I was going to say, so me, I, I mean, I'm pretty much lab based, but I mean, I do double in a little bit of analysis, but um, there's, I think you do need people who are not necessarily expert in, in one or the other. You need to have these people who kind of bridge both and they're not necessarily experts in, in either. They just, they have a lot of knowledge in both. Um, to be able to understand what the needs are from, from the people who are based in the lab, who want to do the analysis and the people who are making all of these packages um, because there's not going to, well, I don't know anyone who can do everything. So that's one of the reasons why our team collaborates with and works with people who are from all different backgrounds. So, I mean, in our team, we've got, um, you've got people who who do develop these packages and who put in people who just work in the lab, people who come from like engineering backgrounds and and um, software backgrounds. And and we like to work with, with people who don't necessarily have just a purely scientific background. I think it's, it's really important to get these people together because that's when you do get these really cool ideas and, and it's where where these packages sort of come about so because you do need a lot lots of different types of skill sets for that thank you emily and you say that dave landed you in it but to be honest nice <laughs> uh did you want to say anything else michael um well i suppose in many ways just sort of echoing that i think to say that um the <clears throat> excuse me the, the strength of the team is that everybody has different strengths and between everybody can sort of cover all bases and i think we don't necessarily need to be an expert in what each other does, but I think it is necessary to have some sort of understanding of, of, of each sort of bit of it. So, um, um, yeah, I think we've got to sort of understand it, but not necessarily be expert in it. But as a team, we can sort of do everything. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Michael. We maybe have time for one or two more questions um does anybody have anything they'd like to raise i know there was a question about microscopy magnifications but isaac sorted that in the chat any final bits before we log off no all good okay well maybe we can just leave it there um <coughs> there is this discord chat that we can uh, jump on as well um, but you, you should have be able to find more information about our wider group as well on the website and be able to contact us through that. So um, please do if any questions come later in the week or, or later today, don't be um, 
shy about sending a message, um, we'll, we'd be happy to get back to you. Any okay. other if you want to say, speakers or Muzz or Susie? Well, from my side of things, I just want to say thank you for the most, one of the most fascinating lunch times that I think I've had in a, in a little while. It's been absolute, absolutely brilliant to listen to what you guys are doing um, and just a, a massive massive thank you and welcome do do jump onto the discord if you want to see where some of these ideas um go basically over the next 10 days you'd be very very welcome um and with that i'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today thank you muz for um for, for attending too um and for doing such great work for the human cell atlas we hope to see you again soon thank you Susan. thank you everyone thank you bye-bye Thanks, Susie. No worries. Thank you, Simone. As always, a total pleasure. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it's 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 always it's always good to do stuff like this. So thank you for arranging that. No worries at all. And thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Matthew. Lovely to see you all. And Stephanie for coming. Fantastic. Enjoy the right. rest of your days. And you. Bye-bye.